today I'm all about flavour combinations. I've got a rustic meat combo, traditional cheese with a twist, and a crazy cake decoration. And it's all happening right here in my kitchen. Welcome to Pies and Puds, my favourite kind of food. I've got plenty of tasty grub in store for you today, and here's what's on the menu. Coming up, this little piggy wins prizes. I'll be making some hearty fare with award-winning charcuterie, reared and cured right here in the UK. Wow, what a collection. <laughs> it is, isn't this it? This is only some of it, yeah. too. Really? Yeah. yeah. I'll be using it later, and the smell is incredible. Tangy, salty cheese goes beautifully with sweet, crunchy apples, but I go a step beyond and serve them hot in this delicious dessert. That, for me, is a proper pie. That's an apple and Wensleydale pie. Cake artist extraordinaire Adam Cox joins me to share his tricks of the trade. Is this one yours? Is that mine? I see, you don't know, do you? Yeah, there you go. Adam can turn anything into a cake, even me. Wow. That actually looks like me. Well, that's the idea. My guests get to join me to taste all of today's dishes. The cheese is very subtle, isn't mm. it? My first recipe is a savoury pie using an ingredient we have in abundance, the good old rabbit. It's lean and healthy, and I want to pair it up with another flavour. For our continental friends, rabbit is a delicacy. In Spain, it's sabre chorizo. In Italy, it's pancetta. So I'm taking a leaf out of their book with my rabbit and pancetta pot pies. When you think of pancetta, you don't normally think of sourcing it right here on our shores. David and Karen Richards are artisan charcuterie producers, making some award-winning piggy products in Dorset and taking the south of England by storm. We were here last year and it was really busy then, nearly sold out and hoping we're gonna sell out today. Today, the Richards cured meats appear to be attracting some new fans. What do you think? I think it tastes yummy. <laughs> you think it tastes it's yummy? Oh, it's nice. Yeah, it's a really nice, quite smooth, not too strong. So, you don't think of this as being British, though. Not no, when you go for this. cured meats. No, 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 not for cured meats, no. No. But that's good. That was really good. Yeah. I'll put it on my way if you like. <laughs> It's not just Karen and David's customers that think their charcuterie is amazing. We put it uh, into uh, um, the Taste of the West Awards last year, and I'm thrilled to say that we won the best cured meat product in the whole of the Taste of the West. So, yeah, we're really pleased with it. The charcuterie and pancetta that David and Karen produce rivals the best that Italy, France and Spain have to offer. David's interest in smoking, curing and drying meat started on a small scale until it became much more than just a hobby. I was made redundant at the age of 50 and I couldn't find another job. And um, my dear lady wife suggested that uh, I try making a business out of what was a hobby. And it's been very successful. For David and Karen to create the best pancetta they can, they get their pork from their local pig farmer, Sam. He rears free-range rare breed pigs called Oxford Sandy and Blacks, which have a perfect fat to meat ratio and a great flavour. They are free to roam the woods and snuffle out tasty treats like chestnuts and acorns. If they're free-range, then they tend to be it's happier meat that you're dealing with. Sam keeps the pigs for us uh, for considerably longer than uh, he would if they were, say, pork pigs or bacon pigs, but I need them bigger than that because then you, you, get the, you get the fat actually marbling in the meat, which you wouldn't get normally. So these pigs are earmarked for you. Uh, we, they're not ready yet because you need them a lot bigger than this. These would normally go for probably bacon at this size. How much longer have we got before they'd be ready for charcuterie? Probably another two to three months. At the bottom of their garden, David and Karen hand cure, air dry and smoke salamis, chorizo and wild game. It's the pancetta that David is particularly proud of. 
We make pancetta from the belly of the pig. Uh, we carefully cut the belly and uh, take the skin off. And then we, uh, we mix a, a, a blend of herbs and spices and curing salt. David has his own special recipe for the meat rub, which he's perfected over time. He uses a secret blend of fresh herbs and spices, including salt, fresh garlic and thyme, bay leaves, juniper, and mace to impart some amazing flavor into the meat. Once the salt and aromatics are rubbed in, the meat is then left for two weeks to absorb the flavor before it's left to ferment and mature for months. Well, the reason for curing meat is to preserve it. As you can see, this is starting to dry now. It's turning a lot darker. It's, it's quite flexible still, so it's got a long way to go. In Italy, in the, in the mountain regions, the, the humidity tends to be absolutely right for the production of charcuterie products. Here in the UK, it's, it's a whole lot harder. So we have to use rooms like this uh, to, to recreate what they've got naturally. If there's too much humidity in the air, um, then you often get um, mould growth on the, on the meat uh, and it can go rotten. So really, without rooms like this, which are temperature and humidity controlled, it's really difficult to produce a consistent product. David's pancetta is his pride and joy. So this is the finished pancetta. This has been cured, it's been fermented, it's been air dried. This is just heavenly. David and Karen's passion for their cured meats is clear to see, and I can't wait to add this rich flavour to my rabbit and pancetta pie. Karen, David, welcome to my Hello. kitchen. Thank you. It's fantastic to see home-produced charcuterie, because most of the time it comes from France, Italy, Spain. It's nice to see all this being made in this country. Wow, what a collection. <laughs> it is, isn't this it? This is only some of it, yeah. too. Really? Yeah. 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 So just run through what you've got here then. Well, at this end you've got uh, air-dried beef. If we were if we were in uh, Italy, then we could call it brisola, but we can't. So that is dorset air-dried beef. Oh. That's dorset. Dorset, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's got huge depth of flavour. It yeah. It's got port in the cure, so you get a lovely long finish when you're eating it. Do you make biltong as well? No. no. <laughs> you could though, couldn't you? We could, we but could. That's, that's just too easy. Yeah. Oh really? Yeah. <laughs> That's not what the South Africans say. <laughs> well, sorry, but it's too easy. OK. Now, you're moving on to the, the pancetta. Yep. Now, obviously, it's to do with the fat and the mm -hmm. meat and the way mm -hmm. it's cured. Now, when you come down to this, which looks like pure fat... It is. That's back fat. And that is cured and fermented back fat. Mm. And if you were in Italy, you'd actually just slice that off and eat it yeah, as it yeah. was. You're it's, kidding me. It's divine. Honest. It's absolutely divine. It's well, infused with uh, truffle oil and it's got English, just, truffle, oil, English yeah. truffle oil. We've I used can on smell it. the truffle yeah, oil, yeah, on yeah. it? Yeah. I think what I'm going to do is a rabbit and pancetta pie. Oh, yum, yum. Using your gorgeous pancetta. I don't use rabbit as often as I should. It's so lean, which makes the pancetta a perfect pairing as the fat works to impart more flavour. And what I've done here, I've browned off some of the meat from the rabbit. And I've still got a couple more pieces to do, which I'm going to pop into a pan. There's a little bit of butter and oil in here. Just brown them off for about five minutes. Now, I need some pancetta. Which one do you recommend? Do you know, I think I'd probably go for that one. OK. It's got sort of a really good, good mix of, of uh, meat and fat there. The smell of that is incredible. It's got thyme and lovely things in it. Pat on the back to you. The fact that you win in awards now based on all your hard work as well. I mean, it proves the point. Pat, it's all about passion. Yeah, it, it is. It's understanding yeah. and learning as you go into which you imagine you still are. Yeah, still every day. <laughs> oh, yes. I add some garlic, fennel, onion and the dorset pancetta to the pan I use to brown my rabbit in. So the mixture keeps all that lovely rabbit flavour. That pancetta almost melts as soon as it hits the heat. That's the, that's the fermentation changing the fat. Mm. It, it really yeah. helps it render down very, very fast. Now, what I'm going to do now... Where is it? Over here. I've got some wine I'm going to add to this. And some chicken stock. Add the rabbit back into the pot. Look at this. It smells... God, it smells wonderful. It does smell great. Now, you leave that to cook for about an hour, hour and a half on a low simmer. 
And once that happens, then you, you take the rabbit out and then reduce the liquor that's left in there. And if you look over here, this is the liquor that's been reduced in the pan. You can see the fennel, you see the pancetta, you can see the onion. And obviously the rabbit at this stage has not, not gone back in there, but it's about to go back in. I add some cream to the reduced liquor to give an extra touch of luxury and some chopped parsley for the herby freshness that really complements all the flavours. So I've got the rabbit here that's been taken out and cooled, and basically you rip off, you flake the rabbit and pop it back into the creamy mixture. Mm. And once you've done that, the whole mix needs to cool down, and that is your filling for your pie. Have you ever done anything with, um, with the rabbit? We, yes. we have, yeah, but we, we actually tried um, doing a, a smoked rabbit loin, but it was delicious, but it's so much work. Such a but, fiddle. But I haven't, haven't done a, a rabbit and pancetta pie yet. I think that's, mm, that's going to be on the menu soon. Mm. It's a little bit different. It is a little bit different. I'm just going to try a little bit of this now. Actually, it's quite well seasoned. It's uh, quite well seasoned. I've a little bit of salt, a little bit of pepper. Now, at this stage now, take it off the heat and then leave that to cool. As the filling cools, I prepare my pastry. For this recipe, I've already made a rich buttery pastry that just needs rolling out. You can see the butter in there. So you know this is going to taste fantastic. You've got the beautiful filling. And it's only right that you spend that bit of time also on the on the pie as well because the lid itself is all part and parcel of it you want that flake you want that butteriness you want that crunch to go with it as well so what you do is you've rolled out your pastry i'm going to fill a couple of them over here i have my cool filling you can see the cream see the rabbit and you put that straight into your pots you don't put the pastry underneath you just put it no. on the top no, not, the, not design like this. What I'm going to do is make a lid. OK. But, I mean, you could... I, I would do it if I was doing a thinner, you know, thinner pie. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Something as deep as this. You're always going to have a problem with soggy bottom. Soggy bottom, yeah. yes, I know the problem. Uh, <laughs> does it rain up there a lot, does it? <laughs> I've made individual pies today, but you could make a large one to share. Now, I'm just going to roll out some dough. You'll see why in a minute. Cut that in half, but we get a couple from there. A little bit of flour. That butter's sort of starting to come out as I roll it out, you see. And then you get each pie, just push a bit of dough around the lid. Once the lid is on, use a beaten egg to wash the top and then bake at 200 degrees C for 25 to 30 minutes or until they're gorgeously golden brown. Look at this. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, look at that. Very hot, but very delicious. Mm. And there you have a rabbit and pancetta pot pie. These little pies with rabbit and delicious Dorset pancetta are a perfect winter supper. I like to serve them with buttered greens and some roasted carrots. You'll have to wait a little bit longer, guys, to try it. But thank you very much You're for bringing so your charcuterie. Thank yeah. you. Coming up later, I'm inspired to make an apple pie with a twist after visiting the home of Wensleydale cheese. It's delicious, it really is. That, for me, is a proper pie. That's an apple and Wensleydale pie. And I make a Madeira cake with a totally tropical feel, thanks to my pina colada flavouring and exotic decoration by cake designer Adam Cox. You have gone for the theme of the pina colada, so you're just <laughs> chilling out on the beach. I've been baking cakes for over 30 years and I've been eating them even longer. 
I've seen them baked in all shapes and sizes. Well, I thought I had until now. Adam, welcome to my kitchen. This is incredible. They don't look like cakes. Well, that's they, the idea. These are works of art. And when you look at something like this, which just frankly is incredible, it's, it's, it's the thought process that goes on inside your head to be able to create it. Well, it's, it's, it's more the idea to start with and then it just sort of all comes together as, as you're sort of doing it. You sort of let your imagination go with it and, it, um, and you know, hopefully... I don't, they're not finished until I'm happy with them, so that's the, uh, that's the main thing. Adam Cox first discovered his flair for cake design at the humble age of 18. He now runs his own cake-making company and his incredible cake creations are so popular they've even attracted celebrity attention. What strange things have you been asked to do? Oh, well, you get asked to do all sorts, but um, the character ones are very popular because uh, this got such a personal touch, so, you know, that isn't anyone in particular, but I get pi people sending pictures in of them and their dogs, for instance. I really try and get a feel for that person and, you know, get to know them to, to make a cake which sort of suits them and them only, so... Um, yeah, so obviously I've made the, uh, the bread because it's appropriate to the, uh, the programme and obviously your line of work, but I've made another one as well, which is more appropriate. <laughs> and it seems Adam knows me better than I expected. I was told you were into uh, fast <laughs> cars, but uh, wow. we needed a bit, more, uh, a bit more on there, so I got, I'm that on actually there, got, so. got my uh, mum doing a bit of research and she found an old interview where well, you said your hobbies included flying your uh, model Spitfire, so... <laughs> so I thought, that, um... That's, uh... <laughs> that actually looks like me. Well, that's the idea. You've got the jeans right. You've got the shoes... Actually, you've got the shoes absolutely bang on with colour. Well, the shirt... I quite like the fact that it's, it's buttoned down to my navel. If I undo could've this done, down to there... Could have done a bit more toner. <laughs> yeah, a bit more toner, exactly. It looks a bit peaky. It's obviously been on holiday since I did that. <laughs> yeah. That is incredible. And this, uh, you are right about this. I is that do, right? I, I do actually well, have my remote will get the control. Brownie points for yeah, that, I do have the, a remote uh... control Spitfire. The attention to detail that Adam manages to capture is really amazing and testimony to his sculpting skills. Now, let's see if he can teach me a thing or two. I'm going to try and teach you how to make your own model of yourself. So, the way okay. I would do it. So, have you ever done anything like this before? Uh, a, a little. A little? Yeah, but not much. No? Well, what sort of thing? I went to art school and studied sculpture. Oh, right. Well, there you but... go. <laughs> a little... But that was a long time ago. Hey, doesn't matter. You haven't... I hope you haven't lost it anyway. Oh, no, I definitely lost it. I lost it a long <laughs> time ago. What were you ago. using to sculpt with? Clay. Clay. Well, it's yeah. very similar. Adam has prepared his icing in advance using edible food colouring. So we've got the blue for the jeans. Yeah. Now I saw what you were wearing before, and so I pre-made the uh, the shirt colour. Yeah, good. And then uh, and then a couple of shades of brown for the shoes, and then the old the old important my face. the old important flesh. So yeah. So first of all, what we do is so we'll split this. I'll do one at the same time as you. I'll okay. talk you through it. Just do what I'm doing. So so first you have to knead the paste a little bit and sure you're used to kneading. We we'll all have our ways. Then we're going to make it into a sausage. OK. So you just roll it out, and I start from the middle and sort of work it, work it outwards. This is going to be a pair of legs. Right. Not one. So we do them at the same time, because, you know, try and cut as many corners as you can, speed up the process. OK. And then, uh, and then just bend it in the middle, push it together, and there's your pair of legs. So then we're going to make two shoes. So that can be one, that could be another. They're yours. Mm hmm Then just roll them into little sausages and then stick the shoes on. What I do is I just put a little indent where the join in your leg would be, just yep. underneath, and then just bend the paste up in the join where the knee would be. So this is acting as the cake. Right. OK? So now we're going to do the shirt. So you take your bit. And then again, you just want to knead it together, make it so it's stretchy a bit, roll it into a bit of a sausage. Most things start with a ball and either go into a cone or a sausage or just basic shapes and then you just sort of go from there. Yeah. So then this is going to be the, the chest. Yeah. So we'll flatten it out as much as you want, you know. Yeah, it's dead flat my stomach. Yeah, there you go. And then we'll just put a little mark down the middle and then we're going to just Ow. stick that in there. 
Adam uses dry spaghetti to form a hard frame or dowel to keep the sugar paste in place. The beauty of using this type of pasta is that it can be cut to size and it's also edible. This is going to support the head as well, so we want to leave a bit excess on the top. OK. And then just add a little bit of water just around your waist, here and here. Is this one yours? Is that mine? I uh, see, you don't know, do you? There you go. That's right there. Mine's the smooth one with no crack on the knees. Are you sure? I think you've swapped them around. No. Right. I told you I did sculpture. <laughs> Hey, hang on, we're not done the head yet. That's <laughs> <laughs> true. <laughs> we make the intricate hands and arms, which Adam makes look very easy. Right, so this is going to be the head. OK, the first thing you do is put the nose on, and that gives you a guide for where everything else on the face goes. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah I suppose that makes sense. OK. How long does it take you to sort of do these cakes? I mean... Uh... One of these in an evening would be, would be fine. One in, in the night. evening? I mean, that's, that's, that's rapid. Well, you know, it's, you, have, you have to be fast, you know. I look like an angry baby. That's all right. I think it's a new monster in Doctor Who. Yeah. So, for the hair, you want to just pipe the hairline on. Right, and then literally just put a bit, little bit of the black on. And then we'll just brush the back on. Brush. I like the way you've done that, actually. So, flick up the fringe a little bit. Check. Like you say, you can, you can spend as little or as long as you want on these bits, you know. I like that. Yeah? Yeah, that's pretty cool. You're happy now with yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then just a touch in the beard. Well, that's me when I'm older. OK, well, I've done... Yeah, we've, do, we've got you now and you in, in 20 years. Exactly, yeah. I think we covered it. 30 years. That's fantastic. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Adam. I've learned a lot, actually, about the modelling process and building it all up. It's all about layers and technique. Yeah. That's brilliant. I've seen lots of cakes in my time, but never anything like this. Adam captures personality in his cake art, which gives it an engaging and very original dimension. Later, I challenge Adam to let his imagination run wild on one of my recipes, a pina colada cake, and he doesn't disappoint. There's a saying in Yorkshire that apple pie without cheese is like a kiss without a squeeze. So I went to Wensleydale, the home of Yorkshire cheese, to find a perfect flavour for my apple and cheese pie. This is Hawes, deep in the Yorkshire Dales, and home to one of Britain's best-loved cheeses. David Hartley runs Wensleydale Creamery, where they make traditional Wensleydale cheese, of course. Wensleydale has been made in this valley for generations, but since 1897, the Hawes Commercial Creamery has been churning it out by the bucket load. And it's proved so popular they've been experimenting with a mix of flavours that might give traditional cheese enthusiasts nightmares. Here we go, this is what I've been here for. There's so many cheeses to choose from, I guess I'll have to try them all. This is all about. Wensleydale with a combination of multi flavours. Whether you're looking at ginger, cranberries, apricot, pineapple, this is going to be interesting. We're going to start with the basic one first. Wow. It's a classic Wensleydale, it's crumbly. It's got a lovely flavour, though, inherent flavour, and you're left with that classic crumbly cheese flavour left on your tongue. It's delicious, it really is. Classic Wensleydale is already a tried and tested recipe, but what about the more unusual variations? Ginger. I'm not sure about this before. I can smell it before I've even eaten it. The texture's bang on with this cheese. That ginger overwhelms the total flavour of the cheese. It brings something to the table, but for me, you might as well just have some caramelised ginger. So, no to that one. It's too strong for me. It's a no from me on the ginger, but how about the Christmas classic, cranberry? Nah. First thing you taste is the cheese. Then the texture of the cranberries comes in. I also know for a fact that's their best seller. Now, that makes perfect sense to me. Looking at the combination of flavours between the two and textures, that one went hands, hands down ahead of that ginger one. But there's a few more to go yet. That pineapple one's too sweet for me. And I think it breaks down the cheese far too much. It is like that classic pineapple and cheese on a stick. 
This one's interesting, lemon. Wednesday dough with lemon. That just tastes like cheesecake. You just need a digestive biscuit underneath it, and there you go, a cheesecake, which is maybe not a bad thing, but not for me with the cheese. Next up, the garlic and chive. Surely that's a winner. Far too garlicky. I don't like that at all. I can't taste the cheese at all. Garlic just overwhelms everything. The last one isn't Wensleydale, but I can't resist the taste. Hot and spicy cheddar. I mean, look at the size of the chilies in there. I mean, that's chilies with cheese. That's not cheese with chilies. There's one thing that springs to mind of what I'd use that for on nachos. It is a cheddar, so you could put it in between the nachos. You get that little bit of heat to go with your nachos, a little bit of sour cream, a little bit of salsa. That would work really well, but not too much of it, because that's quite strong. I think it's got a bit of chili stuck in my throat. I need to go get some water. Wow. I've chomped my way through some of the more novelty cheese choices, but none of them have really tickled my fancy. Complete with a fetching red hat, I track down the boss, David, who's rustling up the most popular export, Wensleydale with cranberry. I smell a bestseller. The traditional cheese is blended down into crumbs, and then fresh or dry cranberries are added. The cranberries that we use come from America, and one of our biggest export markets is when they have a cranberry back in America, which is great. When did you start adding you know, ingredients to your cheese. I mean, were you not happy with your cheese for some reason? We were, yeah, we were very happy with the cheese that we made, but Wentadale is a comparatively small part of the overall cheese market. And when we started up, which was back in 92, by the mid 90s, there was a growing market for cheese with fruit blends primarily. And uh, Wentadale and Apricot was one of the early cheeses, but we then invented Wentadale and Cranberry. But Wentadale, because it's a creamy, milky, cheese, it does lend itself to those sort of sweeter, fruitier blends. And it's just a huge part of what we do now. It's about 30% of our business, but it's our best selling export line as well. I can't believe that one, just under one in three cheeses sold has got cranberries inside it. That, for me, proves the point that flavor combinations work as long as you get those combinations absolutely spot on. Some of the world's tastiest dishes challenge your taste buds with unusual flavour combinations. And although combining apple and Wensleydale may seem like an odd choice, they're actually a match made in heaven. I've decided to use the traditional Wensleydale for my apple pie, and if it succeeds like the Wensleydale and cranberry combo, I'll be on to a winner. So I'm armed with the country's finest crumbly cheese, and I'm also joined by Yorkshire lasses Liz and Sue, who've lived in Wensleydale all their lives. To celebrate this champion of British cheeses, I'm going to bake them an apple and Wensleydale pie. Liz, Sue, welcome to my kitchen. So you're from Wensleydale? Yes. Both of you? Yes. Near Leyburn. I mean, I remember sort of making my way to Wensleydale and that beautiful countryside and single track roads. Yes. It, what a magical place to live. Yeah. So I take it you've eaten a fair amount of Wensleydale then? Yes, yes, yes. And, and normally eat Wensleydale rather than any other cheese. Over the years, obviously, um, Wensleydale cheese has, has, has changed. They've, yes. they've moved, they've modernised, and they've created some, I mean, fantastic blends of yes. cheese. Yeah. yeah. The dairy have done an awful lot for employment in the Dale. Mm. They've saved this, mm. you know, the buyout, they saved the, che the creamery, the dairy, as we would call it. Mm. And without it, Upper Dale, Upper the Dale, Round Hawes would be in big trouble. Mm. Now, we've got a selection of cheeses here from Wednesday Dale. And it, it almost shows the sort of movement from cheese from the original, yeah. from your family sort of supplying the milk, mm. getting all the milk to the original dairy, mm. into the, the sort of modern take on Wednesday Dale. Um, this is the original Wensleydale. I mean, what do you think about this original Wensleydale? I mean, is it still something you eat often? Yes, my favourite. Is it your favourite? Yes, yes. My favourite and my friend's favourite on Christmas Eve with Christmas cake. What, Wensleydale? Wensleydale yes. cheese with Christmas yes. cake. It's wonderful. OK. <laughs> you see, I think it tastes like... Cos I'm, I'm a lad from Cheshire. Yeah. Right. It does taste like Cheshire a little bit. Yes. It's crumbly. Yeah. It's got lots of flavour. Yeah. Now, this is a cranberry one. What do you think of the cranberry one? Yeah, I like both the fruit. I like the apricot one as well. The apricot one, which yeah. is this one. Yeah. I mean, do you not feel um, 
As a business, it, it's one step too far out in this stuff, or is it something which you think the Wensdale is so precious, but you think, okay, fine. As long as they keep the Wensdale, traditional Wensdale yeah. there. I do like the original Wensdale, in fact, so much that I'm going to use it in my recipe. Right. So what I'm going to make is an apple and Wensleydale pie. It had better be good. These ladies know their Wensleydale. I'm going to have to make a cracking pie. I've made a sweet short crust pastry for this pie using butter and flour, sugar and a pinch of salt. Use cold butter to get a firm breadcrumb texture before adding water to bind the pastry. Now I need to split this into two. One for the lid and one for the base. So you get your bit of pastry, flatten it down. Little turn for luck. But you didn't do that, did you? No, we didn't teach. Did you kill the jars? We didn't do that with the children at school. Either. <laughs> what? We both teachers. We both home economics teachers. Oh, are you? Yes. So you passed on. Where? Where? Retired, and pastry was a nightmare. Why? At, well, 22, 30 children making pastry, and it does end up like rubber. Yeah. Because they they, they play with it. Difficult to ha to handle. It's something which you just gotta you've got to be careful with it. I think. And just gently take it out, keep it moving. I think keep it moving is the key. I think once you, once it stays in one place, you have a problem. The steamroller effect. Well, yeah. I think I think if you keep on moving it, keep a light dust in the flour on it, then it begins to sort of find the right, the right shape. Because the more that you work with this dough, the more rubberized they get. Because what happens is the gluten content begins to bind together. I'm going to roll it up, get the base ready, just take it right to the edge, and then roll that out. I'm going to coax it into, it, into place, push it right down into the bottom, and then drive it up the side. Now, what I've got here is the lining for the apples to go inside. Once your tin is lined, skin and roughly chop some cooking apples and some Cox's apples for their sweet, juicy flavour. I think the ladies will want a bit of a bite of their pie, so I'm keeping the apple nice and chunky. Now, what I'm going to do is cut up some of this Wednesday dough. I'm going to add some of this cheese to the top. Is it something that you'd like to use? Oh, yes, have it, have it with apples. Yes, but, yes, but not, not in, cooked in the pie. Not cooked in the pie. Now, I'm adding some, a little bit of sugar to that as well, because there's some tartness coming from the, the baking apples. Now, I think that will probably do. Now, this is going to melt inside. So the next thing I want to add is the lid. Now, once you've got that cheese in there, I mean, you think it shouldn't work. It shouldn't work. Cheese and apple you'd have on a plate with a, almost like a ploughman's lunch. Yes. Yeah. But baked inside a pie, I'm curious to think now what you're going to say about this pie itself. I roll out a lid with some of the remaining pastry from earlier. Once it's on, push it down onto the base to form a firm seal, trim off any excess and then crimp the edges. I'm going to take a little bit of pastry, I'm going to try and make a little bit of... a little... a little bit of decoration. Now, first of all, you just need to... Roll a little bit of pastry out. Just mark it, go round, a bit like a heart. Every baker hates waste, so use the leftover pastry to make your pie look that little bit more special. Don't forget, I've got two Yorkshire lasses to impress. Go in a bit, out, get rid of that. It looks a bit like a heart at the moment. Get a little bit for the top. Then use some egg wash on it, which I've got here. Brush the top with egg all the way along. You can enrich this egg wash by putting an extra yolk in it, make it very, very yellow. Get your little apple, stick it on the corner. A little bit sticking out of there. A little bit of egg wash on top of that. Get some sugar, coat it all over the top. My pie is now ready for the oven, which is preheated to 200 degrees. Bake for 30 minutes until golden brown, or in my case, take out the one I made earlier. Mm. Look at that. And it smells. It smells so good. You've got that beautiful apple in there. 
you've got that two types of You've got the Cox, you've got the bacon, you've got the two different flavors, and you've got that Wensleydale cheese in there as well, melting with that gorgeous golden pastry. That, for me, is a proper pie. That's an apple and Wensleydale pie. I know what you're thinking, cheese and apple? But trust me, Yorkshire folk have been eating this for years. I hope Sue and Liz enjoy it later. Ladies, thank you for joining me in the kitchen. Thank you. Thank you. But you'll have to wait a little bit longer to try it. Right. Thank you. Earlier, cake decorator Adam Cox brought in a cake he made especially for me. I was told you were into uh, fast cars. That actually looks like me. Well, that's the idea. Now I'm going to test Adam's artistic skills further. It's a cake decorating challenge with a tropical twist. Adam, this is a pina colada cake. It looks delicious. It's made in Madeira, so it's a bit more substantial. Can you make that look fantastic with your icing and all your sugar paste? I think between us, we can, uh, we can do a good job of it, yeah. Right. I'm going to show you guys how to make it now. But in the meantime, now this is buttercream, which can go on the outside or whatever you want to do. Leave it with me. Pina Colada is a classic rum-based cocktail flavoured with coconut and pineapple. I've incorporated these flavours into my buttercream, which I've made with softened butter, sifted icing sugar, coconut liqueur and pineapple essence. Now, if you can mix that together, that's your buttercream coating for that, if that's of any use to you at all. No problem at all. Now, when it comes to a pina colada, it takes me back. <laughs> it takes me back to, ooh, last week when I was on holiday. Now, everyone's had a pina colada. It's normally that strong coconut, it's the pineapple, and a little bit of cream. So I'm going to make a Madeira cake, something that Adam is now beginning to decorate, but it needs to be substantial. It's probably going to take some weight. So to start with, you need the flour in the bowl. I'm making a Madeira sponge using the all-in-one method, which means everything in the bowl at the same time. Start with self-raising flour, add seven whole eggs, caster sugar and margarine. But you could use butter in there. So you could use half margarine, half butter. Some people, when you look back at the old recipes, will actually use lard or they use um, a good baking margarine. Again, it tends to make it quite soft, whereas butter does have in it its inherent problems. It does bring a little bit of flavour, but sometimes it doesn't often go into the cake well. It can split. Margarine does give you that second chance. There's a lot of eggs in here, so we're going to bring all this together now. And a little bit of milk going in there too. And finally, coconut. This is one of the key ingredients also in a pina colada. A little bit of coconut. Now, get your mixer. If you've, got a, if you've only got a balloon whisk, and then break it down with a wooden spoon and then begin to beat it with a balloon whisk, but it's going to take you a while. But if you've got one of these, all the better. Start off quite slow. Watch it, mate. Sorry, mate, am I covering you in, uh, in margarine? I know you're trying to sabotage my work, but... <laughs> Why would I do that, Adam? Again, mix all these ingredients together, get in there. It's a big bowl, this one. So it starts slow, and when it's all blended together, then goes super fast. So how are you getting on with that? What do you think of the cake? The cake itself is a delight to work with, actually. You know, you should do this professionally. It's really moist. Uh, I think... Uh... I think the cake itself's got a bit of body to it, which yeah. I think what you, what you need to put yeah. any weight on it at all. Yeah, yeah. You don't want it to be really soft because then it starts to sink when you're build, building the decoration up on the top of it. Precisely. Now you can see at this stage how wet it is. Now you can see all the globules of fat going in there, but it needs to be mixed together properly. So high speed, and then get right in there, start breaking it all down. So what are you going to put on the top then? Well, I've had a think, and I think we should uh, pina colada. You'd sort of enjoy chilling back on the beach, so we'll do a nice desert island theme. Liking your thought there, Adam. A little bit longer. It's beginning to come together and cream together quite nicely. We see that now. It's a lovely, glossy mix. Named after Madeira wine, Madeira cake is a dense sponge with a firm yet light texture. It's classically served with afternoon tea. Madeira is very popular in bakeries, especially in the 70s and 80s. We used to bake trays and trays of this, and this is a great base for any birthday or celebration cake. Bit of cream, bit of jam, and that's it. But 
what Adam does is take it to the next level, but Madeira has always been a good base for a good cake. Lovely colour there. I've mixed uh, two blues together to give it like a marble effect and then it makes a nice, uh, a nice sea effect from the top of the cake. It's fantastic. Thank you. Now, there we have it. There's our mix, which is good to go. I'll get rid of the blade. Now, I'm going to put, pop this straight into a, a tin. Get the majority of it in first. This reminds me of my mum, actually, you know, making cakes years ago, these massive bowls. Now, uh, you set your oven at 160 degrees C. Now, this will bake for about an hour and 30, an hour and 45 minutes. It's a big cake. It's a substantial cake. So leave it in there so it goes golden brown and do the skewer test after about an hour and 20. Start putting your skewer in, check it in the middle, see if it's coming out clean. This is going to go straight in the oven. Now, obviously, Adam's had the cake now for about, ooh, three hours. Have you got on? Well, you know, I'm just taking my time, making sure it's up to scratch, you know. It's very neat. Thank you. So what's this going to be, then? What's the base of the cake? Basically, we're going to cover it in the, uh, in the blue colour and then put a little uh, disc of, of sand on the, in the middle. Not obviously sand, but sand colour, which will, uh, will act as the island. And then we'll do a little scene on the island, which will have a palm tree and obviously a little pina colada, probably, and uh, hopefully a guy on it chilling out, enjoying himself. No rush then, mate. Hurry up. I've done the cake. I'm looking forward to seeing that later. I know you're going to come up with something pretty special anyway. Hopefully. Leave it with me. After a busy day in the kitchen, there's nothing better than sitting down with my guests who've helped me create today's dishes. First up, we have the beautiful rabbit pancetta pies made using Karen and David's award-winning dorsa pancetta. I can't wait to hear what Liz and Sue make of my apple and Wensleydale pie. And Adam has done something rum arkable with my pineapple and coconut cake. What did you do with that cake? Because it looks stunning. Yeah, I've gone for the theme of the pina colada. We've even made a little one here, so you're just <laughs> chilling out on the beach. <laughs> we'll um, see if it tastes as, as, as good as it looks. Living the dream on a beach made of cake, my very own dessert island. Well, today's all about flavour combinations. Tell us what you think of that pie. <laughs> that fennel really comes through, doesn't it? Mm. Mm. It's quite a delicate meat, isn't it, Rabbit? I think mm. people always think it's going to be quite strong, but it, it never is. I think the pastry has to it, because it's like a proper pie when you put a pastry lid on it like that. If you'd like to uh, put your fork into that um, apple and Wednesday I'll cheese pie and tell me what you think of that. The cheese is very subtle, isn't mm. it? It is. It doesn't shout out that there's a lot of cheese in it at mm. all. Mm. But it's there. And that's got the pina colada um, icing as well. You notice how I'm avoiding carving you here, yes. so you might, you might want to keep it. <laughs> Cheers. It's lovely. Tropical summer. Mm. We've made some great recipes today with those flavour combinations that, for me, really worked. And I hope it's inspired you to do the same in your kitchen. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Cheers. Good food. Cheers. Cheers.